Hey, hey, Hope City. This is Pastor John. It is Thursday night. Um, hopefully my cell signal holds up. I'm having some Wi-Fi issues, so if there's a little lag or some um, uh, interruptions, I apologize up front. But uh, a couple things I want to talk about tonight. Um, I preached this past Sunday in our sermon series, Hope Arrives, and it was hope for you. And I think it's important to remember that God loves you. That should make you feel good. That should make you have excitement. That should bring hope to your life. Because hope, you know, the uh, one of the definitions of hope is a confident expectation. It, it means basically you have an expectation of something good happening for you. And, you know, I like the definition of, you know, hope is a, um, oh man, now my brain just went blank, but... Um, Hope is a positive imagination based on the Word of God. So whatever the Word of God says about you, you can expect that or you can imagine those things happening for you. Um, we've talked about Abraham in Romans 4.20, how uh, that 19, 20, 21, how he believed what God said and he never stopped believing and he just praised God. He had an imagination, a hope for his future. He had a hope that the promise that God told him that he would have a son, that God was able to make that happen for him. <clears throat> so, um, you know, I was thinking about, you know, whenever you preach a message and then you have to go back, it's hard to not just expound really even further into it, but in for a longer time. So this like, well, five minutes I have left now. Um, but there's a couple of scriptures in that story that I talked about on Sunday about the woman caught in the act of adultery. And... What I want to talk about is, let's look in verse 5, John 8, 5. If you have your notes, great. If not, um, they're on our Facebook Member Connect page. Uh, you can go on there. You might have to scroll a little bit to find them, but they're there. Um, but it says, Now Moses commanded us in the law that adulterers should be stoned. What do you say? So the context that these people are talking about is all law-minded. There's the law. It is just. It is punishment. It is performance it is you do right and everything will be fine if you do wrong then you're gonna get stoned you're done um, so they were all super law-minded they didn't want to think about any type of mercy or grace except when it came to them of course but anyone else it was the law so in verse 6 says they obviously had a clear agenda to snare him in their efforts to build a case of lawlessness against him Jesus bent down and began to write with his finger on the ground and I love the way the Mirror Bible paints this picture. He bends down in the ground distract, and starts writing, distracting attention from the girl. He drew all the attention off of the act of sin. So think about this. They had in their law, there's acts that are sinful that got punishment. Jesus was really talking to them and distracting them about, this is not about your act of sin this is about what you believe about yourself. He's trying to shift people away from seeing sin as an act or an action to a belief. And that is so radically different than what religion has taught us, what people in church have taught us, maybe what we've heard preached places, maybe what we were raised to think. Because, you know, you, you go out and you do something wrong, you know, you, um, you drink, you get drunk. You know, and you do certain things, and all of a sudden now you've sinned. And and I, I I love the way Jesus took attention from that action. And then he says, "Well, those who are here who have no sin, let let him cast the first stone." So he said, "Fine, if you want to play by the law and punish for a sinful act, then those who have never done a sinful act feel free to throw a stone." So he answers them in accordance to what they're pursuing and according to their mindset is all law-minded. He raises it to a level and says, fine, if that's the, the rules here, then you have to play by the same rules. And it goes on and, it, and basically everyone leaves. Everyone's gone. And then Jesus says to the, to the girl, says, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She answered, no one, Lord. And I love it that he made her answer. Because now she heard herself say, faith comes by hearing. She heard herself say, no one condemns you. No one is condemning me, Lord. 
And Jesus said to her, neither am I condemning you. Go and sin no more. And what I mean by that, he could have just said that, but what I mean by that is, do not believe a lie about yourself. See, I think we believe, because the Bible in Romans, it talks so much about sin and righteousness, and if you're dead to sin, Romans 6, if you're dead to sin, then how, you know, how does that work? If I'm dead to sin and alive to righteousness, but I still sin. So, what, he, what, there, what Jesus is doing is taking it from an action to a mindset. And what Paul's really trying to do is take it from an action to a reality of who you now are in Christ. So, as someone who is, let's say, before you're born again, let me ask this question. If you were a sinner, then, before you got born again, and then you do good things, acts of righteousness... Does that make you, therefore, righteous? The answer is no, because your nature never was changed. So, so no matter what good works you did, you could never measure up to the point of being righteous in the sight of God because you could never make it to that point of righteousness. So, even as a sinner, no matter how much righteousness you did, you could never obtain righteousness in God's eyes. So, as after you're born again, your nature is changed from death to life, from darkness to light. You now have the spirit of Christ Jesus found in righteousness, born in righteousness, made righteous in God's sight. So you are right in God's eyes. You are in right standing with him. So conversely, let me ask that same question. If while you are a Christian, you're a born again Christian, what sin or how many sins does it take then therefore to become a sinner? And I know this kind of blows people's mind, but Jesus has taken it from an action to a belief. And what you believe about yourself is what you'll produce. So if you think you're a sinner, you'll produce sin. If you think you're righteous, you'll produce righteousness. So if you're a Christian and you sin, does that mean that you're no longer dead to sin, that you're alive to it? No, it means that you messed up. But you're still who you are is righteous because that's who Jesus says you are because of what he did. So this is a lot longer teaching, but I'm just going to throw a grenade out here and see what, what uh, happens. But, you know, you are righteous. See yourself righteous. Do not believe a lie about yourself that just because you mess up, therefore you're no longer righteous. Now you're a sinner. That is a lie. You are who God says you are. And if you are born again, you are holy and blameless in his sight. And he loves you and he will never condemn you, just like that lady who was thrown in front of him. So anyway, that's what I got for tonight. Um, God bless you all. I know it's been a little past seven minutes, uh, but anyway, thank you for watching. Let's tune in every night, seven o'clock for all our sevens at sevens, and hopefully you're getting something from them. Uh, comment, share, uh, you know, tell a friend about it, because I think there's people out there that need to know God is not mad at them. He's not condemning them, and and even if they've never accepted him as Lord and Savior, Jesus loves them and he died for them. And it's, that's, just, that's just nearly too good to be true. It's nearly uh, not understandable that someone would do something like that for someone who's their enemy. But that's what he does. That's what he did and that's what he does. So he loves you. Share the good news. Share the goodness of God to bring hope and transformation in Christ with anyone you come in contact with. So God bless you, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.